David. I'm a web developer and I've been working with Python on the web for several years now, probably four or five years now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Flask, which is a micro framework that I discovered. I did not write this framework. Um, I found it. It's written by a guy named, I think, like Armin Ronashar. He's Norwegian, so you know it's awesome. Um, you can follow, you can see me on Twitter and on app.net as singing Wolfboy, and I've already posted a link to the slides on that account if you want some spoilers. Can you speak up just a little bit, please? Oh, oh sorry. Wait, wait. wait. Oh, no, no. There's a button. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Better. Hooray! Hooray for better. All right, so I'm going to be talking about Flask, which is what's known as a micro framework. Um, it's designed to be very <coughs> limited in scope in terms of what it can do, at least by default. Um, I'm going to talk about this because when I first started doing web framework programming, I started out with Django because it's what everybody uses. Now, Django's mascot is the flying, beautiful pink pony but after using something like Flask for a while, I've come to think of Django more like an elephant. Um, it is very large, it is very powerful, and unfortunately, it is, in many ways, it is very bloated and does things that I don't particularly care about. Now, there are some times that it's great to have an elephant. That, you know, it gives you a lot of power, it gives you a lot of flexibility, and it allows you to do some amazing things because so many things are already built into the framework and you don't have to worry about implementing yourself. But I don't want to cross the Alps. I just want to make a simple website. I mean, sheesh. So <laughs> this is Flask. Flask is small, it's compact, and it fits a lot of features into a very small package. Um, it's also extensible, so you can turn it into a giant robot that does all sorts of crazy things, sort of like the elephant, but I'm getting a little bit off track here. So Flask, at its heart, gives you really three main things, which I have found to be the core of making a simple application. It gives you URL routing, which is the idea that the user goes to a specific URL in their browser, and then the, the framework manages the logic to, to look up the exact function that needs to run to respond to that URL. There's templating, which is taking the output of your function, taking the raw data, and formatting it to look pretty. And there's error handling and debugging because none of us is perfect. And if you've ever used Django error handling, it's nice, but it doesn't really hold a candle to the sort of things that you can get with Jinja uh, and with Flask as well. So, example time. This is a full Flask application. This is admittedly a very simple application. This is an application where if you go to the root of your website, you can see it says app.route slash, um, you can, it, it routes to you directly to the hello function here. And all this function does is it returns the string hello world. Very simple, it's your prototypical hello world application. And running it is equally simple, you just install Flask using pip, and then you run it directly. And you can see at the bottom of the file, I have it saying app.run. So it has its own built-in web server. It's not a great web server, sort of like Django's built-in web server. You don't want to use it for production work, but it works just fine. Templates. Um, templates allow you to use the integrated Jinja templating system. And you can see if you have any experience with using Django templates, they look almost identical. Um, in fact, there are only a couple of very small changes between the, gen the integrated Django templating system and the Jinja templating system, such that if you have a set of Django templates, you can port them over almost without any sort of changes. Another thing to notice in this example here is I'm actually using the route decorator twice. That means that there are two different sets of URLs that are going to route to this function. I also am using a variable in the URL, so you can see that it has that name in brackets. So you can go to slash hello slash Frank, for example, and that will end up calling the hello function with name set to Frank. You can also see how the variables are seamlessly passed in from the URL to the function to the templating system and picked up by the templating system at the other end. It's very smooth, it's very simple, it's very Pythonic, which is the way that I like it. So there's also the debugger. This is an example of a debugging output. You can see that it's very clean and it gives you a full stack trace. 
It's also hard to see in the, stack, in the static example, but at the very bottom, you can see there's actually a console where you can type in things and find out inf information interactively about the error that you just made. It's a little bit hard to describe how this works, so I'm going to give a small demo. I've been told never to give live demos, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. <coughs> so this font is actually much too large. Just a moment. Well, yes. So, sure. Um, so here I have a very similar Flask application to what I was working with before. And so I have app.route slash. So if I run this, and I already have it running here, then I can go to my browser. There we go. Hello, Flask. Very simple, very easy. And that's the output. I can also go to slash hello slash name. So let's see, slash hello slash David. And it goes directly into the template. I can pass in anything I want here, and it just gets passed through seamlessly. Now what happens if I just call hello slash by itself? I get some sort of a not found error, which is not exactly what I was expecting. Oh, I see, because it, it's requiring you to have a template here. So let me change this around just a little bit, because this wasn't exactly what I was hoping. Hello slash. Save, rerun. I might have to restart the app server. There we go. Happy little internal server error page. You can see that by default, the Flask, ser the Flask server does not tell you what's going on, because of course it's a huge security hole to have this debug output on by default. But I can go down to the bottom here, I have my app.run, and just say, Debug equals true. Start again. There we go. Now I have my handy little debugger. And this tells me exactly what the error is. Cannot concatenate string and none type objects. And it gives me a full trace deck. So let's see. I have my, oh, this window's too large. I have my contacts down here. This is where the bug is from. I can hit this button to open up the console, and I say, let's say, what is name? Name is nothing. Uh, what else is going on here? Ours is not defined. Um, what if I wanted to get some other context? So let's say I say foo equals r here, and we start it. I can actually look up in this context here. Uh, sorry, this is the peril of a live demo. <laughs> that foo is indeed bar in this context. And I can do dynamic introspection here to find out exactly what the trouble is. So that's something that saved my ass plenty of times, to be able to determine how things are working and how things are breaking. Oh, there were actually. I have one or two other examples I want to do, but I'll do them later if I get a chance. Um, so, hooray, now I can show off my cat pictures and my simple little static website. But I want a rating system, I want a guest book, I want things that require a little bit more power and a little bit more functionality. So I want to integrate a database. Now you'll notice I said at the beginning over here that a database is not one of the things that Flask really gives you. And some people would consider it to be core to be a web to a web framework. That's one of the ways that Flask is different. It's, as I said, intentionally stripped down. It's designed for people who just want to make simple static websites at the start and build up from there, sort of like Legos. It doesn't give you everything and the kitchen sink to start with. If you want to add them, you can. So if you wanted to add a database, you can use extensions. Extensions give you a lot of power, and they give you a lot of the same things that you can find in a larger and more established web framework like Django. So the canonical database extension is called Flask SQL Alchemy, and it uses the SQL Alchemy Python extension, Python module, which has support for a whole bunch of different databases. It has support for all the databases that Django's ORM gives you, and a bunch of others as well. 
So it also gives you, Flask also has modules that allow you to link to what uh, other non-SQL databases like MongoDB or CouchDB or other things. You can also just use your database's Python interface directly if it has one. It's just Python and it's designed to be easily integrable with anything else that's out there. So that's databases, but I'm not really impressed. What else have you got? So Django has an admin, Flask has an admin. You can find it with the Flask admin extension, and it gives you a really nice, really clean, and easy to use administrative interface, which is, I believe, based on Bootstrap as well, which is yes. nice. Uh, Django has board management, Flask has board management. It uses the excellent WT Forms library, and the module is called Flask WTF. It does all the same sort of things as native Django forms, except in an external package, which you could swap out with a different form library if you want. It also has a bunch of other functionality that you can add via extensions. Caching, email, OAuth, REST APIs, Markdown. I actually wrote that last one just a few days ago. It wasn't that difficult to write either because the Flask API is very easy to understand and it's very well documented. Um, Flask also has a whole bunch of other cool features like thread local response objects so that you don't have to pass a response down through every single level of your nested functions. You can just access it as if it were a global. Uh, it has ses session management so that you can keep track of the user's sessions and show them nice little messages when they do something, like upload a file. You can confirm, yes, we got your file. Everything's all right with that. It has blueprints so that you can write a reusable Flask application and have it work on a sub-URL of what you're working with. So for example, if you have a Flask, an asset management system that's written in Flask, you can distribute it to people and they can install it as a blueprint so that it shows up in slash assets under their application and all their other URLs are unchanged. It has really great support for unit testing and a whole bunch of other nice things as well. And all of the things on this slide are actually built in. That being said, the source code behind Flask is only 1900 lines and there are over 250 pages of documentation if you check the PDF and see how many pages that is. It's also, of course, searchable via an online interface, just like the Django documentation. I happen to think it's actually better organized than the documentation for Django. Um, so all of this makes Django a very sad elephant. And <laughs> so basically, in sum, Django is large and monolithic. Sometimes you want that. Sometimes Django is a powerful solution. And if you know that you're going to be building a large web application that needs to do a bunch of things, you might want to use Django because it has those components already written. But it's difficult to change and replace them. It's a steep learning curve because there are so many things that you need to learn. And there's not really a whole lot of flexibility. Because they give you all of these things, they assume that you're going to use them and that you're going to use them as intended. If you want to use them slightly differently, it becomes rather painful. By contrast, Flask is small and extensible. Extensible, It's like Legos. You can add complexity and components as necessary as you go. You can learn one step at a time, so just master the core. And then when you need more things, you can learn how to use that extension as well. And you can write the application the way that you want. If there's something in there that you don't like, you can take it out and you can change it. In fact, the author suggests that if there's something about Flask that you don't like, you can fork the project and make your modifications. And the whole thing is hosted on GitHub. It's small and it's easy to use. So you can even submit your modifications back with a pull request and maybe they'll get accepted into the project. So that's Flask. That's the website, flask.poopoo.org. And does anybody have any questions? What kind of features are there for reading request headers and sending response headers? Reading request headers and sending response headers. Actually, that is a very good question. Um, Flask has a thread local request object, as I was mentioning. So if I do from Flask import request, can't see the end of it here, then I can do down here, let's say in my template view, I want to get the name from request.args.get name. And in my hello template, you can see it's the same template that I had in my presentation. If name is passed in, it should grab it that way. So let's try running this. And the URL you can see is slash template. Start. 
start. So there's hello, because I haven't provided, hello world, because I haven't provided any name. And it doesn't like it. I may have screwed up exactly how this works. Can you pass it into the vendor template? Ah, that would be it. Thank you. <laughs> Always a hazard of live coding. There it is. Main equals foo bar. I don't know, whatever you want. Um, you can get uh, the post request, the, the post arguments in the same sort of fashion. It's just request.post instead of request.args. And again, because this is a thread local object, you can import it at the top of the file as if it were a global. It's not actually. All of the complexity behind that is managed behind the scenes for you. But you don't have to worry about all the drawbacks of a global variable, because if you need to have it as a pass-through variable, you can do that as well. There's full support for that. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, how well does it scale in a production environment? Um, I don't know that from personal experience. But from what I've seen and from what I've read, it actually scales quite well. Um, because the core is so small and so nimble, first of all, it's very easy to avoid extraneous overhead. That's kind of the whole point of the framework. And so by doing fewer things, you can get them done faster. And because the code base is so small, it's very easy to audit it for you know, performance reasons as well. If you want to find out more about using Flask in a large environment, you can go to the Flask documentation, which, as I said, is very well organized. Uh, docs. And I believe it actually had a section on getting big down near the bottom. Yes, there's a lot of documentation. Becoming big, yes. There's a whole section about it. As I said, I haven't used it myself, so I can't provide a whole lot of information about that. but. From what I've heard, it's certainly possible. The other thing that I should mention is uh, Ned was going over my slides and he asked me about what about third party dependency hell? You know, I have all of these different fragmented parts of the ecosystem. How do I know that they're going to work well together? Well, Flask's answer to that is actually um, there is an extension section on this page, extensions. And it lists a whole bunch of, quote, approved extensions, or at least well-known about extensions. Some of them have a little star next to it, such as Flask CouchDB. That means that the author of Flask, the framework, tests this extension in addition to all the rest of his code whenever he makes an update to the application. So these things are not included as part of the source code of the actual framework but they are tested and they are made sure to work just as if they were. So that's how you know that the, that the ecosystem is going to work well together because the author and the people who maintain the project ensure that by not releasing a release until it does. Uh, do the routes have regex support? Um, you can do regex support if you want to by using the routing function manually, I believe. Um, by default, no. And the reason for that is because most routes are pretty simple. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the documentation is on that, but it's pretty easy to find, and I know that it's possible, just not sort of the, the default way of doing it. So instead of relying on the uh, There is, in fact. The question was, is there any way of making sure that all of your third-party extensions and dependencies <coughs> are of a certain version? Uh, that actually has nothing to do with Flask itself. That's part of the Python ecosystem. So there is a tool called pip, which is used for installing packages. I believe it's uh, a recursive acronym for the pip installer for Python. Uh, might? No, it's not that. <laughs> 
this guy. Um, and pip allows you to specify a requirements file so that you can say, I want to install these packages exactly. And you can provide the same sort of syntax, I believe, that you would use for NPM, the node package manager. So you can say, I want this package the latest version, or I want this package exactly this version, or no higher than this version, or no lower than that version. It's very flexible. Do you have pip install? Uh, I do have pip installed. So pip freeze. I am actually in a virtual M. So that tells me all of the packages that I have installed in this specific virtual environment. And you can see that it includes them in the same sort of format that you would specify. So you can just stick this output in a requirements file, feed that to pip, and it will grab exactly these versions off of the Python package index. So good question, but Flask is small and intentionally doesn't include its own package manager. Anyone else? So does it have an ORM or? Like um, Flask does not by itself have an ORM included. Again, because it's designed for smaller websites that don't necessarily need a database at all. If you want to include an ORM, you can use one of the extensions for Flask that are designed for that purpose. So Flask SQL Alchemy uses the SQL Alchemy ORM. Uh, so that is sqlalchemy.org. The Python SQL Toolkit and Object Relational Mapper. It's a third party extension. It's used by many different projects. It's very high quality, very flexible. And the idea is if you want to use an ORM, you use a product that is designed to be an ORM. Anyone else? So you mentioned you wouldn't use that server in production. Mm -hmm. You can use any sort of uh, <coughs> battle-hardened web server that you want, including Apache or Nginx or anything that you want. Flask also has documentation on how to set up Flask for, um, for serving professionally. I don't remember exactly where that is. This is a pretty common pattern, in, in, at least in Python web frameworks, that the framework itself provides what's known as a WSGI application, um, which is a web standard gateway interface, which is a standard way that Python web applications can made up with web servers. And the framework itself will provide a small, simple web server that's really only suitable for development. And then when you want to go into deployment, you find an existing uh, web server like Apache or Nginx or Tornado or Unicorn that can host WSGI apps, and you can put the two together. So you have sort of a mix and match. You can choose your framework, and then you can choose your deployment strategy and put them together um, in production. Yep, and you have a lot of different choices, and as you can see, a lot of documentation for a lot of different choices. I'm a lot of remember you can, um, you can deploy Flask to Heroku as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Heroku gives you like almost a month, they give you a month free uh, CPU time, so you can throw your app up there. Yep, and not only that, but Flask actually has a Flask Heroku extension. Um, there it is. Set Flask configuration defaults for Heroku-esque environment variables. And it's actually written by a guy who works at Heroku. So they love Flask there. And I believe they use it in all of their Python documentation as well, as this is the, the example app that we use, that we love, that we want you to use as well on Heroku. So what are the drawbacks? The drawbacks of Flask are that it's small, for starters. It doesn't give you all the things that Django gives you. That's both a benefit and a drawback. So like, give me an example of something that's missing. Uh, an example of something that's missing. Um, Django has GeoDjango. It has an integrated uh, geographical mapping service based on, I think, God, I don't remember, um, PostGIS on, Post on PostgreSQL or something like that. Um, Flask doesn't have anything like that yet. Somebody could write an extension for that. Um, Django has integrated RSS feed support. Flask doesn't have that yet. Somebody could write it. Um, all of the Django ecosystem that exists out there for Django is not compatible with Flask, of course. Uh, but then again, Flask has its own ecosystem that's not compatible with Django. So there aren't really a whole lot of fundamental drawbacks to Flask, aside from the fact of it's not 
as popular as Django, and as a result, it doesn't necessarily have as vibrant of a community as Django. It doesn't have as much stuff baked in as Django. But again, some people might look at that as a plus, because if nothing else, it gives you an opportunity to get an opportunity to get away from some of the mistakes that Django has made. And the developers of Django have admitted, you know, there are some things that if we could go back and do it again, we would redesign this to be different. But at this point, they're constrained by backwards compatibility. Class doesn't have to worry about that. Can I have a, the handling of a request to set a global variable in Python that a f subsequent request can read? Um, the first question I would have for you is why? <laughs> because they don't want to have to deal with the database. And I've got a complicated data structure, and it might even be a big one, and I'm not going to have a lot of users, and I just want that thing to be around in memory, you know, when the next request comes in. Okay. I want to say that that is possible depending on how you deploy your application. Um, if you use a solution like Mod Python, which is an Apache extension, that's designed to have one long-running Python process that simply uh, serves requests one after another without actually restarting the process. And for something like that, it should be theoretically possible, although I don't actually know. Uh, for other systems like Mod WSGI, it's designed to be completely fresh every time you get a new request, and I don't think it would be possible there. But again, any sort of situation where you want to persist information between requests, you want to use a database for that, because if you delve into global state and keeping th things in memory between requests, you're going to have problems. You're going to have issues where bugs crop up and affect multiple requests, and you don't know why. Debugging it and troubleshooting is going to be a bitch and a half. And in general, it's something that you just don't want to do if you can avoid it. To, to expand on that, the, um, you, it would probably work if you were careful in how you deployed it. The thing to remember is that you'll be going against the grain of most of the web culture in which you are building. Because most web applications are designed, like the web itself, to be stateless. And that every request is independent of the request that came before other than what you've persisted explicitly to a database. So for instance, lots of websites will handle two subsequent requests on completely different machines, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, and some of the deployment options that you've got will do things like, well, every thousand requests, I'm just going to restart the process, because why not? It's all stateless anyway. And it may be doing that without you realizing it. And by the way, if your server bounces, in a stateless system, you wouldn't even notice. In yours, the data would be locked. So you have to be very careful. You might want to look into something like Flask Cache, which helps you set data in memcache or some other external system like that, which is very, very fast. And that way you can, for example, render a template once and just serve up the cached version on subsequent requests, if that's what you're looking for. There is middleware, in fact. Um, middleware is hooked in. What's middleware? That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the idea behind middleware is there are some common things that you're going to want to do on every single web request, such as, for example, you might want to check to be sure that the user is logged in on a certain web request. And if the user is logged in, maybe get some information about the user and attach that to the request object so that the view function can access that later. Um, if you want to install middleware, first you search for it in the documentation. Um, so middleware is a standard feature of WSGI, which is the web server gateway interface in Python. If you've used Ruby on Rails, you might be familiar with a, a situation, a, a piece of software called Rack, that, that fulfills exactly the same function. It's sort of underlying component level of the web framework. So you can hook in any sort of standard WSGI middleware. Uh, just by by importing it and wrapping your app around it. So, for example, I have my app set up over here. Um, I could do. I don't actually have the Flask Cache extension installed at the moment, although I could install it pretty easily using pip. Um, Flask.ext.cache import cache. And then this cache function, this cache class, excuse me, actually acts as a middleware. So I can do cache equals K 
cache from the app. And I believe I can just do something like cache this route. And by doing that, um, this, this class makes a wrapper around your whole application and says, okay, any function that is decorated with the cache decorator is now going to first check memcache and see if we already have a rendered response for this, temp for this uh, view function before trying to do any, any work. If we have it, great, serve that out. If we don't, then um, do the function, get the results, and before sending it to the user, stick it in memcache so that we'll have it next time. So this is actually an example of a middleware layer, getting caching set up for your application so that you don't have to worry about hooking in a memcache system at the start of every single request. What does it have for uh, sessions or authentication? Um, authentication is not a standard system in Flask. Um, one reason for that is because there are so many different authentication systems. Uh, you have your standard password-based authentication, you have Google authentication, Facebook authentication, OAuth, a whole bunch of different things. So there isn't really a standard um, off, so, off system at the moment, although there are some extensions that are trying to handle that. Uh, type. Flask principle is one plugin that's attempting to do a sort of modularized authentication framework for Flask, you can use that. If all you want is sessions, sessions are actually baked into Flask. Um, and that is in the documentation sessions. So the idea is you set a secret key in your application, which is just a string of random bits and bytes and so on. And anytime you want to set some session information for the user, um, it, here's an example. So let's say I wanted to set the username in the session here. Anytime it does that, it uses the secret key that you set to actually encrypt that information, and it sets that information in a cookie on the user's browser. That way you can be sure that the user hasn't tampered with that information before sending it back to you. And then you can retrieve that information on later requests just as easily by using the session dictionary, which again is imported from Flask. So this is another thread local. It looks and acts like a global, but if you need it to not be a global, if you need it to be passed through, you can access the functions underlying it as well. So I guess if you have a bunch of redirection, you would have to handle every single URL? Um, I mean, it depends on how you structure your views. If you want to structure something so that every time you have a URL that matches a certain pattern that you redirect, then you can just write one function and decorate it with your app.route decorator, and then just do it there. Um, you can see that Flask also has a redirect function, which is built in, and you can just return a redirection to a URL. This example is using the URL for function, so that you don't ever have to hard code in your URLs in any place except for where you define it up in the route. So you could just have one function that handles the use the use case that you're looking for and redirect from that function. It can be as fine-grained or as large scale as you need it to be. Anything else? Is there like a common extension or something similar to a what extension? Comment. Comment. Um, a comment extension for Flask. Not that I know of. Although... What is comment? <laughs> ah, not comment. Apparently not. Um, comment is a... It's apparently an icy small solar system body. <laughs> um, <laughs> comment... The second one. Second one. Programming, a web application model using server push communication. Um, so, no, I do not know anything about that, although presumably it wouldn't be hard to integrate into Flask manually, and from that point, it wouldn't be too hard to write an extension for Flask to do that. But I don't know of any such thing at the moment. Um, Flask does not have search built into it, again, because that's not really core to a, to a web framework. 
But um, to be fair, Django doesn't really need it, although it's got large third-party tools that you can use to do that. What's an example? For Django? Yeah, for you have to go across the street to hear about Django. <laughs> well, for Django, there's a thing called Haystack, which is a, a wrapper around a number of different full text search engines that integrates into Django models in sort of a Django y model y kind of way. Yeah, so Django does have that. Um, there's also Woosh, though. Um, Woosh is not in any way, shape, or form specific to Flask or any other framework for that matter. Uh, it's just a pure Python search engine. Um, I don't actually know all that much about it. I think it might be whoosh.org, maybe? No. Whoosh is, is a search engine, right? It's a search engine. Yes. Right, and Haystack is a wrapper that kind of adapts to the whoosh. Yes. Right. Okay. So um, I'm not aware of any Flask-specific search engine wrappers. Um, but you can use search from Flask just the way that you would any other Python module from any other Python program. Um, I believe that probably one reason why search is not closely packaged with Flask is because having a search system is, is needed, you need it to integrate with your database models. Otherwise, what are you searching for? And because Flask doesn't